Welcome everybody to the Wonder Year podcast with me, Paddy Raff, and I'm joined as ever by the co-host slash producer, Rigsy. Hi. How's the form? I'm good, yes. I'm very much enjoying this. It seems to be going down reasonably well. Yep. That's me kind of selling myself a bit short, but that's how that's how <laughs> I like to play it. Everybody's loving it, basically, is what he you're doesn't. saying. It's going mad. <laughs> Everyone's going mad about it. Thanks for uh, getting Million behind the downloads. podcast. <laughs> we've, we've broken Spotify. Uh, thanks for getting behind the podcast, everybody. We're enjoying doing it. Hoping you're enjoying listening to it. This week's podcast is, our guest is Julian Simmons. We recorded this a couple of weeks ago, maybe. Yeah, Julian, obviously an absolute legend for people. Although I thought it was just people of our generation but I've spoke to people a lot younger than me who they all absolutely love him as well so he has kind of managed to to have a legacy that transcends yeah age he's ever present on our screens weird gig to be to, to be so famous off the back of doing continuity I suppose in terms of like you, you will have seen Julian on a lot of different things and you, you get this you know as he's got this character that transcends the things that he does everybody knows him they know the crack but he's more than just the catchphrases and I think in in this conversation I really enjoyed hearing a bit about you know where he came from 82 is when he started making those steps towards being on TV and stuff also talking about being one of the first sort of openly gay men on TV in Northern Ireland, I think. Yeah, but it's kind of, you know, he wasn't necessarily openly gay and that he hadn't sort of officially came out. Yeah. But he... Wasn't hiding it to, to wasn't an extent, yeah. To his credit and the way that he talks about um, his attitude towards the little incidences of um, homophobia that he would have encountered, sadly, and how he influenced other people who saw him on TV and felt inspired by what he was doing. Yeah, his, it was nice. His attitude is, is story. incredible. It's very helpful and... and um, yeah, he's a he's a um, credits himself, and and I loved learning about that side of him. Yeah, very interesting guy. Uh, we loved, but like from he walked into the room, and I actually did. Um, a wee, and he, like he's got the he's got the the X factor, the aura. Yeah, like he's he is brilliant that way. Uh, but yeah, I did like a wee a fashion thing, we fundraiser as Nigel, and he was brilliant. Like he was just such great crack, and you could hear him down the corridor making everybody laugh. And so it was brilliant to have him in. And uh, quick shout out to the sponsor before we get into this week's podcast. The sponsor still is Victoria Square, uh, Riggsy's favourite. They still haven't discontinued because Riggsy loiters in Victoria Square. I do loiter in Victoria Square. Um, my favourite spot to go in Victoria Square and you laugh, but I don't think we've ever actually included this in the podcast is Five Guys. Um, no, I'm, we have, we cut, I keep cutting it out, but I do want to say <laughs> that there's always a debate about Five Guys being too expensive. It's absolute nonsense. What you get, what you pay for. You go in there, it's a treat. It compares to oh, going to a restaurant He's where you might spend paid. quite a lot of money. But with Five Guys, He's you get these absolute burgers. elite level burgers, incredible chips that are like nothing else you'll taste, and endless pop, endless pop, literally. Did you, you hold on, you call, you're, are you calling like Coke, Coca-Cola pop? But you see, it's more than Coca Cola. I call it pop. Oh, you don't call it pop. There's though. such a selection of of of. Um, Sounds like a. It, there's the, it, it, is like nowhere pop? else in the in the in the in the country you can go in and get bizarre. I mean, they're all stinking, obviously. Oh, is this bizarre the selections? All oh, right, okay. Fair see, you don't know half of this. You always give me stick, but you can I go in call and get pop, you get mixed though. cherry with lime and all. I mean, it is absolutely disgusting. Hopefully, nobody that. has switched Just off. Just go and get a coke like anybody else. I do Would apologize. You have the option of playing around. If anybody has switched off because he said pop, well, who am I apologizing to? Come back. <laughs> I don't know. I don't still like that. It's like the word pearly. They always, he's awful poorly. Do you ever hear that? I hate that. that. I hate the word poorly. It's it's an ick word. It's a kind of pop. <laughs> when you say pop, it makes me feel poorly. All right, so Victoria Square, they want us to push the gift card. It is a great idea. If you're like me, bad at buying presents, get the gift card. You can use it anywhere within Victoria Square. And which is, oh, Victoria Square kind of like just starts, doesn't it? Like where, where is the boundary? Where does it start? Where does it end? Where it's does it end? Concept. It's a state of mind. Yeah. <laughs> you can it's, use this it anywhere. It's, it's, you know, we're all a bit Victoria Square. We're all in Victoria <laughs> Square now. <laughs> anyway, yeah. before we go off on too much of a tangent, we'll get straight into Julian's Wonder Year podcast. Podcast. Julian Simmons is the guest and his year is 1982. What we like to do is pick a year, go back and find out what our guest was like in that year. So introduce us to Julian in 1982 before he hit our screens, I take it. Very naive, uh, determined but to achieve my ambition and that was to work for an airline. Mm because I was in the travel business before that. And then in 1982, by, by 1982, I was ensconced in the Air Canada office in Canada House in North Street, oh, okay. where we did on the f first floor 
deal with all aspects of the human condition. Because as you probably realize at that time, traveling to Canada was like going to the, to Mars. And we were sitting in this room with, on the wall behind us, Air Canada and a big round maple leaf, all in red. And people would knock the door and come in and say, excuse me, is this Air Canada? <laughs> yes, madam, it is. Uh, do you like, uh, go to Canada? Yes, indeed. What part do you want to go to? My daughter's. <laughs> And where does your daughter live? Canada. But what part of Canada? I'll get the envelope. <laughs> and get the envelope out of the bag with the address on it. And then we'd get some idea of where she actually <laughs> wanted to travel to. It's very bespoke, like very tailored. You'd have to be on, on your A game if you got well, a... you did. And, you ha- and of course, in Northern Ireland, you've got to be very... You've got to be sympathetic to the people who... Uh, never uh, At that stage, nobody was really going anywhere long distance. So yeah. a, a trip to to Canada uh, or when they came back after three weeks they'd been to Toronto <laughs> and the lineup at Julian was terrible at check-in in Toronto and I thought you've only been there three weeks you're from New Lodge yes. you're talking yes. like that for it. honest to God you know <laughs> but that's what I loved about it all so that's what you were doing in 82 you were yes. at Air Canada yes and did, did, like you say you were working in the office so had you were aspiring then to be one of the Air stewards or no no I, I was quite happy to be in in, in uh, you know in the sales office at mm. that time and uh, promoting Air Canada uh, and but it's when I got to Heathrow that I then became more involved with the passengers in transit mm-hmm. because Air Canada closed the Belfast office shortly after they closed the Air Canada, the Canadian consulate, which was also in that building. Mm-hmm. So the whole place really shut off. Mm-hmm. And I was offered London and thought I would try it for six months. And I was there for over 20 years. Oh, you were in London for 20 mm-hmm. years? Yeah, well, commuting. Oh, right, so that's what you're... Yes, yeah. you know, the good thing was to be able to commute because, yeah. you know, I could, it couldn't leave Northern Ireland. Yeah, so you just were going over there for however many days and coming back. It was supposed to be six on, nearly four off. Well, you wangled all the shifts. Mm-hmm. You know, you got people to work for you. And then when I was doing gigs, what I used to do was pay people to work for me. So that, you know... Uh, oh, because you were making elsewhere. Yeah, and... I mean, things were happening like, you know, I'd be on the airport bus going up to the International to go to work. And it was like a wee ice cream van at that mm-hmm. stage. It was a wee small wee bus. And my the phone would go and it would be the agent saying, oh, a gladiator was coming to do something in Portadown tomorrow night. Mm-hmm. And he's checking out because there's been a bomb. <laughs> so would you do it? So I'm thinking, right, no problem. Yes, I'll do it. And I get off the flight, go to the order bank in Terminal 1, walk into Terminal 3 and walk down check in and say, can anybody do tomorrow for me? <laughs> and, whoosh, it's gone. Cash for and a then wee job and get hand. that in the, in the shift swap book. Uh-huh. And then now I'm here, I'm working till midnight, but I need to get the 8.30 shuttle home tonight. <laughs> More money. <laughs> you know, can anybody work for me after, you know, cover me for me to gone? So I used to come home on the 8 o'clock, 8.30 shuttle. Did you, would you end up making less doing those other gigs because you had to pay people to do your, your real job? Um, sometimes, but do you know, for some of those gigs, it was fairly big money, you mm. know? It'd be, I suppose it was career as well. You wanted to be able to take these You wanted to be able to do it and yeah. I wanted to be home, you <laughs> yeah. know. Stay, stay close to home then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is what, what I really loved, you know. Yeah. So in 82 then, Riggsy, you'd like to dig up some, some of the things that were well, happening first, then to kind of <laughs> set the scene. First of all, I want to, I, 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 something that's really struck me from the, the start of this conversation is Julian used the word naive and then went on to describe multiple kind of side hustles that he <laughs> yeah. had and you were out doing this and, and, and selling these things on. So you sound like you're anything but naive. I was about many things in life. And I, I, I think at that stage, I wasn't really fully mature, although I was in the Air Canada office. Uh, I, it was really towards the end of my time in Belfast. And then once I got to work in London, I sort of opened up a bit. Mm. And I saw the way people got on and the way... The way the, uh, it took them a wee while to adapt to my form of humour from Belfast mm-hmm. because... Um, the humour in London, although it's quite quite good, it's not as good as ours. Yeah. Not as good as ours at all. You know, you'd, 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 somebody would say something to you, and I would go into Belfast, oh, you're a liar. 
And they would take that literally. <laughs> that I was saying to them, they were a liar, like, you know. <laughs> this is just the Especially way Especially Canadians, they, they have no conception of a sense of humor. Oh, it's very hard. Yeah, it can be lost on them. I did, I, the Americans as well, I find, can be very serious. And... I love American sitcoms, like yeah. Friends and Frasier yeah, and all yeah. that. That's great. See, in real life, it's mm -hmm. like pulling teeth yeah. to get a laugh out of yeah. them. I, I made a joke. at uh, Me and my wife went to Hawaii for our honeymoon. And mm. um, this is 2009. I don't know how we afforded it. I think the credit union are still <laughs> looking for a guy that looks very similar to me with a different yeah. name. But we went to Hawaii and we we're at this big like banquet they call the Luau, which is their oh, sort of yes. you know cultural night. Yes, it's like the 12th, but with grass skirts and stuff like that. So we went anyway, and this guy was telling us about Pearl Harbor, and he said about he's talking about the attack on Pearl Harbor and how it was an anniversary, but Hawaii's anniversary of becoming a state wasn't for a few more years. And I says, oh, so Hawaii wasn't a state when Pearl Harbor happened, wasn't the state of America. He says, oh, no, no, it was a few years later. And I kind of had a few drinks, and I says, here, but it was in some state after Pearl Harbor. And I just went fucking straight over his head. And yes. I went, oh. and I was like, lucky, because that went too far. <laughs> and I was like, I'm glad that he didn't get it. It just went, Psh. he's like, what? Oh, but it, yeah, so sometimes the accent, or the, our, did you find you had to, like, sort of take, tone it down? It out, or did you? Yes. Well, I, I, I did tone some of it down, depending on the company I was with. If I was with, with with the guys from the baggage department or, you know, the ramp people, you could hit ramp it as hard people. as you want. Are these the guys that bring the, the, the ramps Push out? the aircraft back. Oh, right, okay. And yeah. do all that and do the loading of it. And then in, in passenger service, which is what I, I was in, there were some rough diamonds like myself. And we, we, you could joke away with them in fairly good Belfast humor, which they all adopt, uh, uh, adapted to. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but uh, there were some people you couldn't. Yeah, I just had to really tone it back. Mm -hmm. you know? So you get you have that thing. Anybody, everybody knows you from UTV and how you can just like literally uh, like change from one word to the next. You're delivering the you know continuity yeah. very you know yeah you can straight slip from 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 a, a, a sort of sensible way into a broad Belfast way. Yeah, and. Uh, Thank goodness the the public adapted to that oh, and they liked that. Love that, yeah. And I, I don't know if you saw recently there on Twitter some girl like posted videos of you doing the continuity, oh. and she was like, "It's gone quite viral." Like, and she was like, "Oh, I I can't get enough of this." Right. Um, and I was like, "Where's she from?" She was from Oldham in England, and I yes. always thought it was very here, but they you, it's like a real cult. Thing. I used to get letters from the uh, the uh, east coast of England and in Scotland, some of the remote islands. People who like to watch UTV because they couldn't pick up Scottish or whatever mm. uh, was in their area, and that, or they'd heard about me, and they wanted to see see what I did, and they thank God they enjoyed it. But I mean, uh, uh, you always think with English people, you're taking a wee bit of a risk. North of England people are on our our way, totally. and Scots, yeah. Scots, yeah. Scottish people, big North uh, right people of Scotland, yeah. uh, they're on our wavelength. But right down the south, sometimes you've got to repeat it, yeah, and you uh, or you've got to be really careful what you say, yeah. You know, I mean, in the Belfast office, we, as I say, we used to deal with all aspects of the situation. And they'd tell us more. They'd come in and they'd tell us more or less what they had for the dinner. And I had this wee woman say to me one day, now, Julian, if I was to come in here with my sister, you would say to me, there's nothing the matter with her. <laughs> there's nothing the matter with your sister. But, Julian, if she was to make you a cup of tea, she'd do it in the frying pan. <laughs> All this sort of thing, where you had to learn to keep your face straight. I mean, I, 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 at the desk in Air Canada, I, Mary, Mary Dorn was sitting to my right, and there was many times I had to put my back <laughs> when I was talking to her, so I couldn't see her, because I knew I was going to start, or she was going to start, and I was going to pick her up, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, that's always been a difficulty, dealing with with things where, you know, you mustn't laugh in somebody's mm -hmm. face. That's why when I started reading the news at UTV, I was always terrified. I remember reading this about you said that you were terrified that you were going to laugh yes. at like a real horror story. Yes, because it was nerves, you yeah. see. And and I, I knew that I had friends all over the province lying with their nose and mouths pressed into the hearth rug, screaming with laughter <laughs> as I was doing my best to keep my face straight. <laughs> so I used to start the news with my face like... <laughs> granite you know and people used to say why oh, god jesus is gonna be bad tonight look at his face 
because you were just yeah. trying to get in the zone. Uh, well, did you ever were you ever tempted to go an eye on the troubles? Oh, definitely not. <laughs> oh, definitely not. <laughs> just like as a, as a, a like a, as a as a reflex almost. No, the pe- the people in the newsroom at that time would have killed me. <laughs> I'd say there'd been other people <laughs> yeah. be upset about it as well. Do you remember when you actually started doing the the sort of continuity? I and do changing? indeed. I uh, I was on one Christmas for four nights. Now, this is way back at the start of my career. I've been in UTV about two years doing continuity, news reading, and sports results. And that was another story, sports results. <laughs> I hadn't a baldy clue what I was talking about. <laughs> I just read it. But uh, th- for this, these four days, there was no news. And it was all light entertainment programs. And I thought, you know what? I'm now going to do this the way I want to do it. Mm. And I think the first thing I let my hair down was, was the intro to Ghostbusters, the movie. Okay. You know, and so I let rip going into that and then into a, a few other things. And then the next night I did the same. And then after about a week, I was walking upstairs to the canteen and I met one of the bosses on the stair. And he says, I watched you over Christmas and that was brilliant. I want you to keep doing that. Oh, class. And so they, they then decided that they would take me off the news get somebody else to come in and read it, and I would do my way all night. Mm. You know? So that's how it started, yeah. four days over Christmas. Yes. Somebody made a fortune up in the airport covering for you yeah. during that oh, four yeah. days over Christmas. Absolutely, they did, yes. <laughs> and, and Terminal 3, they did. <laughs> so that was the start of it then. And what, what year would that have been, roughly? The oh, three? God, you've got me. Now, uh, that, that must have been 1980... 80... Oh, I, I would say, say, well, go for 88, 88. when I let my hair down. Yeah, because Ghostbusters was, what, 84? So yes, well, it was on TV, TV before it came on TV, yeah, but yeah. it was a big night. Ghostbusters is on oh, UTV. Oh, like premiere, like, yes. and you, you, you lent it. That, yes. that, that's great. Because, like, our, my kids, even, like, whenever they always ask me, who are you talking to today, who are you going to be interviewing? And I said, I'm going to interview Julian Simmons, and whenever I did, but now on the UTV, then oh. knew right away. Like, and it hasn't been on, obviously, for, you know, a few years. Oh, it has it not, indeed. To, to, when did it go, when did you finish? Finish up doing the uh, continuity? Uh, uh, uh. I finished up doing continuity officially just at the start of the pandemic because they made London do all the continuity links. Oh, yeah. And then when I was, uh, it all really finished two years before that when we left Havelock House mm-hmm. because um, I was I was told that, uh, <laughs> it sounds like I'm shooting the big line, but I was in re- I was in Buenos Aires, darling, when I got the phone call from the boss to say, <laughs> ITV are keeping you on, but it's all going to be out of vision and it's going to be pre-recorded, oh. which takes the whole spontaneity yeah. out of it. But I stuck with it, and I stuck with it for two years, mm. two years and a bit, and then the pandemic struck, you know. So uh, it was then that we had 18 months not working, getting full pay, and then... I got a call one day from Human Resources, and I, I thought, I know what's going to happen here. And so the negotiations began. Mm-hmm. But I have to say, Gillian Porter and I were looked after really well. Yeah, she left at the same time. And then, we yeah. left at the same time, and we were looked after well. And and the thing is, I'm, I'm still here. I'm still eating, <laughs> able to make myself a fish supper or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we get the questions from the kids because I, my kids want to ask a question for the guests. So this is a question from who we're going to go with first. Should we go with uh, Clara? Clara, who's four, and this four. is her question for you as well. Hi, Julian. I wonder if you're a good boy or a naughty boy. Oh, at school now. Yeah, oh, at, at school. school. <laughs> that's well, I've been a that naughty off. boy all my life. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> the second one. Ronan's what, was I was I a, a good boy or a naughty boy? I sort of straddled both. You know, uh, I was into having fun at school Mm -hmm. and not being, it wasn't that I was very bright. I wasn't interested. I mean, I could have written a damn good essay, Mm -hmm. awful at maths, Mm -hmm. fairly good at geography. And do you know what I shone at? Would you believe divinity? What's that? Religious religious? education. No, I don't know why I shone at divinity. But I did, mm. and I, I, I think I quite enjoyed the teacher. She was a, and the old school used to wear her, her, her gown and all, and she mm. sat in the high desk and looked down on you like this, <laughs> you know. And I, I, I just found her classes stimulating, but not that I was religious mm. in any way. 
I thought it was in the choir and the bell ringer and all. Okay, but you behaved but, at school then? You were kind of... More or less, yes. Yeah. I wasn't good at, at any uh, sports stuff or anything. I hated all that. Yeah. But uh, I, I enjoyed being at school. What's the most trouble you've ever been in at school? At school? Oh, uh, laughing in class was always the one. And get, getting put out of the class. I mean, did they, did they do that when you yeah, were at school? Yeah, outside. Stand you outside. Wait for... Uh, me and my friend Trevor Hoff, it, once we started, that was it. S- snorting and snuffling and, you know, p- lifting the desk up and howling. That's where, your, that's where your thing came from, about reading the news, le- reading the, the serious stories. You just you thought you were going to start that again? Well, well, this is it. I mean, the thing is, if anybody had ever said, Julian, have you heard the terrible news? About, well, that's me away <laughs> before the, <laughs> they've even told me what it is. <laughs> I, I'm trying to have to get my face set. So, mm. You're, so bad news may set you off, basically. Yes, it's a nervous thing, you know. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we'll go for Ronan's question then. Yeah, why not? Here's Ronan. Ronan seven. Hi, Julian. Did you ever consider stand-up comedy as a career? Oh. Stand-up um, as a career. I've I've sort of done a bit of stand-up comedy. I've done after-dinner speeches where I've told funny stories about my career and everything. Mm. But I haven't done uh, real stand. I mean, I've opened shows and, and done a bit of a comedy routine as such. Mm. But I've always been restricted by the fact that you've got... I had to remember, I was a member of UTV. Yeah. And you cannot go over the line. You can, mm. you can say things the Northern Ireland way. Yeah. Like if I was talking about Liz McDonald in Coronation Street, I yeah. would say she's walking around that street. You can see what she's had for her dinner, which is saying at the north. I mean, if I said what I was really saying, yeah, what does yeah. that mean? She can see what she's had for dinner. She's really skinny. Wearing something no, she tight can and see, revealing. You can see right up her hoop. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Thanks for clarifying. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you can see what she's had for her dinner. You yeah, can yeah. see right up her hoop. You know. <laughs> oh, but you're, to get it, that's awful. But you're not saying it. You yeah, know. yeah, yeah, exactly. You've got that sort of yes. euphemism in between. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think though, uh, people would genuinely love an R, an R with Julian. You know, like just a night you just on stage. Well, it's all right it. if I have somebody like yourself interviewing me. I, mm. I, 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 I think the most I could pull out of the hat, uh, walking onto a stage and mm. talking about myself or to to the audience would be about half an hour. But what That's I would done. do is I'd get the audience to ask me questions now. That's give me an idea. Be a good compare. Yes. You could compare, compare I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, and I'll compare tons of stuff. Well, yeah. it did before the pandemic hit. Yeah. Um, and in terms of, like you were saying there about, you didn't really, because you were on UTV, did I not read that you had done, like, sketches, like audio sketches, whenever you were, like, doing trying to get on TV? Well, oh, when I was younger, oh right. Uh, before I got into TV, I was doing a lot of amateur drama, and I was in the Hollywood Players, Hollywood County Down, not <laughs> California, and I quite enjoyed that. And I did a lot of the comedies that Trevor Hughes wrote, that were very um, current and lovely Northern Ireland humour, based on the troubles, a lot of it. Yeah. And uh, it, they were so successful. And that helped to, in fact, it was after one of those plays in which, called Leave It to the Boys, in which I played an IRA boy who didn't want to, terrified he was, but he was <laughs> he was t- turning bodies out of coffins and putting guns and all in oh, and all really? that. Uh, after one of those, somebody said to me, do you know, you should be on TV. I know somebody that I'm going to write to and I'll tell him what, I'll tell tell you what happens when I hear back Class. from him. And as it turned out, he, that was Mr. Brum Henderson, who was the, uh, the sort of owner of UTV at that stage, the chairman and everything. And his wife was the sister of a girl I used to run about with when I did puppet shows and everything. And she so it's that small uh, kind of small word. As kind of you thing. know, in Northern Ireland, everybody yeah. knows everybody else's yeah, yeah, Grammy, yeah. <laughs> and that's what's so good about it. That's yeah. what I couldn't bear in London. Nobody knows anything. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, you could be very anonymous. I remember reading as well that you were in um, Wild About Harry, written by Colin Bateman, with. You, you acted in that? Oh, God, I did, <laughs> I yes. remember. Because I got a part. Well, I couldn't believe it. I got a part in it, and the filming was done up the Lisburn Road, and I was made up at the BBC, and uh, 
taken up the Lisbon Road in a, in a limo. And when I got there, somebody was standing with an umbrella <laughs> for me to walk from the limo to where we were recording. It was, it was, it was only a, a few lines, mm -hmm. but it was good stuff. Because I, I was chatting with Colin Bateman the other day. I had a meeting with him. I was talking about, and it came up in that. So it was oh, Jimmy Nesbitt God. and all was in it. And, and yeah, yes, that was yes. There was a blast from the past. It really is. God, that was a long time ago. <laughs> it was two thousand and I think it was year two thousand. It might have been out. Was it Jeez. right? Mm. Must take it out. 1982 was quite a grisly year with the news. It um, was. Actually, quite a lot of. Um, tragedies in the air Julian oh uh, yes there were there was Lockerbie and yeah, everything else around that time quite a lot and British uh, Midland yes absolutely and Did Manchester the aircraft blew up on the runway trying to take off yeah and uh, they were all burnt to oh, it was landing I think they were all burnt to death yeah. shocking Jesus. and did you ever did you we ever scared of, of, of I've had lots of flights where it's way. been hairy like but you, I mean you know the captain and the first officer on board, they want to go home and have their dinner as well. <laughs> yeah, they, so they're doing it. It's not the plane doing it. It's, it's yeah. They're doing it. Yeah, I've yeah. had a lot of rough flights and and uh, engines blowing up on takeoff and everything. But you learn, you know, uh, there's no point in getting your knickers twisted, <laughs> really, because, you know, I mean, the, the captain, first officer and all the crew are there to help you. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm, not, I'm not the best at flying, but I always remember saying to my wife, who's way worse than me, I kind of felt like I had to console her. I was like, anytime you hit mad turbulence, look at the air hostesses and air mm. crew, because you, they're all just walking about like it's not a car in the world. They're still serving well, teas and coffees because well, they've, they've been through. It's like, if they're not panicking, they've seen it all before, we're all right. I was, I was on a flight about three years ago going to Hong Kong, and dinner had been served, and... Uh, it was all going very smooth, and all of a sudden, we were just opposite, uh, flying about, uh, over Moscow, and this turbulence started, and it was like hitting brick walls, and the crew had to sit down. Now, luckily, on, for this particular flight, uh, I was in first class, because <laughs> I was traveling with a friend who was crew, and I was sitting in first class, so you've got all this space in your little cabinet, and it's getting flung all over the place, and the crew are sitting in the galley looking at you, and they're going... <laughs> <laughs> and I said, we're all right, you know. But uh, falling about all over the sky, and that went on for about 45 minutes, and then we flew oh, out of it. That long? Yeah. Oh, I'd have been saying, you'd have been all right. Beads out and you'd have been all right. You need a good rough one to make you understand that every, <laughs> what the aircraft can do. I mean, some of them can flip right over, you know. You haven't been on that, though. No, I haven't, but you've heard I haven't of it, done sure. that. But one of the senior crew members told me years ago on an Argonaut. Now, we're going back to four propellers. Right. It was on its way to Canada, and it was caught in a howling gale and was flipped right upside down and went down that way and then leveled out. So that would have been fun to be on. It's good, good to know they can do that, though, yeah. anyway. Well, they can. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> My wife's terrified of flying as well. I'm going to pass on your advice. Don't uh, get your niggers in a twist and see how that goes down. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you should incorporate that into the uh, a safety announcement. Yes. In the case of turbulence, yeah. please do not get your niggers in a twist. <laughs> Other oh. fun things that happened in 1982, um, the Falklands War. Uh, yes, was, was... I was in Florida when that broke out <laughs> on a on on a trip with friends, and the 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 uh, the whole sort of fleet was leaving Southampton, or was it Southampton or Bournemouth or somewhere, and they were going on their way to the Falklands. And my, I was on the phone to my mum, and she said, "You just can't believe that this is actually happening." And then the, the war really, but only only went on for about two months, mm. didn't it? Yeah, it wasn't a long one. You know, it's very, it sounds very glamorous. Every time something happens, you're in. A I'm away. Luxury on location. staff travel. On staff <laughs> travel. Remember, you know. And then the other thing that happened, and this is a negative one, but also a positive one, and it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on this. In Northern Ireland, it basically became legal. To be gay. Oh, my goodness, The homosexual offences, Northern Ireland Order 1982, comes into effect decriminalising homosexuality in Northern Ireland for those aged 18 or over, behind the rest of the UK as per usual. Do you remember <laughs> that happening? Did it have an impact on I, your I life? I vaguely remember. Where were you? Were you on a beach in <laughs> Guatemala? No, 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 it was in the Air Canada <laughs> office in Canada House in North Street. And uh, uh, it... It didn't really register with me, I guess. But I think I remember hearing it and thinking, well, that's good. But at that stage, everything was still very much undercover. Mm. I mean, there was a few gay clubs here, which I never went to at that stage. Mm. And I uh, 
I, I wasn't really out at that stage. Mm. Um, was but it the Crow's I, Nest was one of them, wasn't it? I, remember I always believe it was. It never put a toe in it, you know. <laughs> okay. I, I was, I'd have been scared to. <laughs> in fact, the first big gay club I ever went to was in 1992 in Ibiza. It was Anfora cut into the rock at the top of the uh, top of the town, and I walked into and you know it was I went was with uh, four friends and the whole boom 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 you know that and I walked straight in one door round and out, <laughs> terrified <laughs> flying visit because people were grabbing your bum and everything as you walked through. You know, and I thought, no, no, no. Well, you see, a week later, <laughs> I was walking around it like I owned it. <laughs> you know, I, I, but it really frightened me. And then you get to see that this hard butch surface from these guys and everything, they're pussies underneath. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it's, it, it, you've got to get through that first, you know. And in 1982, then, if you weren't out, were you, whenever people were being homophobic or maybe the government or whatever the people make the legislations did that annoy you or did it was it not really registered? homophobia didn't really I th thank God I was able to brush it off I, I only knew a couple of people that were gay but I remember at one stage I was crossing at the back of the city hall to walk down Donegal Square and you're waiting at the traffic lights and there was a whole crowd of people waiting. And there was this one of these courier vans that run round Belfast. And I, it, as they were coming along, the window was rolled down. And this fella guldered out of it. Look at you, you big fruit. And spat at me. And the spit went past me and landed on the fur coat of a lady standing about six <laughs> people down waiting to cross the road. <laughs> So, the, of course, the van had gone by that stage and the lights changed. And I went over and said, I'm so sorry, madam, that spit was directed at me. <laughs> and I said, so I took a tissue and brushed it off her coat for put her. It on your, put it on yourself. Yes. <laughs> I should have done that, of course. No, I brushed it right off. But uh, th there were things like that. But I just found it funny in a way because, you know, there these guys, you know, the hard men, mm -hmm. you know, big freaky and all. But underneath that, you see, there, there's a softness. Would you Do you think that, like, younger gay men would ever look up to you in a way of being like that you were somebody on TV who was camping it up, especially from here, which was so well, repressed? I've been in, in places like uh, uh, the Kremlin or, or um, uh, Milk or Rain, mm -hmm. And then there's uh, the place down on the on the banks of the Lagan that, that I used to have a gay night, mm -hmm. and people come up to me and said, "You know, you helped me to come out because you made me see that I wasn't a freak." Mm. And I said, "Well, I used to feel I was a freak too until I got to London, but um, uh, it, it, the, when people come up and say that, you do feel, oh well, I've done something yeah. good." And that was just coming from you being yourself, kind of like you yes. say that you know less serious continuity stuff over Christmas. Y y that and you, yes, yeah, you were able to come out. I, I do feel like I I might have said because we did a fashion thing. This is very kind of showbiz. As Nigel, I was asked to do a fashion thing for raising money for Ukraine, yes, and you were in it as yeah, well. Absolutely, and it was, great it was only crack. two weeks ago. It was only two weeks ago. Yes, uh, yeah. and, we're, and we're still trying to <laughs> collate our lost items of clothing. Yes, yes. oh, you're right. <laughs> I have somebody's yes. belt, and you have a jacket missing. But yeah. Um, yeah, but I remember I was saying you might have said you that that you know coming from like sort of a family who had some very religious people in it, and who would have been quite homophobic. You know, mm. they wouldn't have had a bad word said about you and I always thought oh, here's Julian and I never they never saw the almost hypocrisy and it was like mm -hmm. but you're saying these things but then you're loving Eamon Holmes was always very decent to me I thought, still, gonna, I thought you were going to say he still was, is oh yeah and uh, he used to say to me like I don't think he says that our mothers would really mind if they really knew what you're like I says what do you mean <laughs> what I'm like and but you know he, he, he was good at pointing things out like mm -hmm. that you know yeah I, I just felt like, you know, and I like to see the, you know, the fact that somebody was there challenging that almost without challenging it, just mm -hmm. saying, I'm going to come out and be myself on TV, have the crack. Almost the way we all do, we all like it, my mum and I'll go into work and she worked for years as a nurse and she's about three or four fellas worked in her ward, gay, camp as anything. Uh -huh. And for me, I was a kid, I remember there being out in camp and great crack. Yes. And I always thought it was weird that 
cert, still certain members of my family who knew them men yes. would have been still sort of homophobic, but loved the, those guys. And I exactly. Can't the, and there's a, there's a, a conflict there. Yeah, but that's why I always thought it was, it was really brilliant but weird that somewhere in Northern Ireland we had a famously camp person coming out and introducing the TV <laughs> and I love the fact that there's people in England that are picking up on it and just like retrospectively going back I, I think that I can't think of anywhere anybody else on TV north or south that, that did that you know and maybe it did have an impact like you say on, on people coming up to you and it is was that a funny because nice I didn't really set out to be yeah. blazing a trail yeah but it's just that I, I suppose I, I was a camp person, whether I wanted to be or not. You see, my mum and dad came from London. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the public were concerned with that. When I was speaking, I had a posh voice, <laughs> which I didn't like to think that I had. But it was just the their way of speaking that yeah, I yeah. was doing. And then in my job, you had to be polite to people. Yeah. So that reflected on my outside. Mm -hmm. Like, in fact, I still go into airline mode if I ever walk into any trouble with somebody or people upset at a bank or something. Yeah. I say, "What's the problem, madam?" You know, <laughs> and you go into it automatically. You dial it up. Yeah. Let me through. I'm an Air Canada employee. You know, <laughs> so many years later, yeah. I find that as well. With um, I, I started training people in call centers, and I had a very, you know broad West Belfast accent and then because you were going into work and we were training people from all over the world I felt like I had to find like a middle ground of you know not being so Westy and I was heart, like heartbroken one time when somebody turned around and said like somebody from abroad and they were like what part of England are you from and I was like I'm not from England and then I said no. what are you talking yeah. about mate and I had to kind of bring it back down to the way I used to speak I, I was very lucky because I worked in the travel agency first of all and that was mixed so I was going to parties up the Shank Hill, and then I was doing the conga around the army checkpoint up the up the up at Ardoin, you know, and going to parties up there. And thank God, getting all well with all sides yeah, of yeah, the community yeah. and being fairly well accepted. Thank God. C conga lines across the peace lines is yeah. like a, oh, is that the was, way forward. That that was brilliant. You know, it was great doing that. And what kind of music then was knocking about in eighty two then for well, Duran Duran. Yeah, if we if we yeah, Duran Duran the biggest track um, on your birthday. So if we think about Julian's oh, yeah. birthday, we never give out the date because we don't we're give worried that people will use you know. data protection or whatever, right? <laughs> oh, God. So, but what we like to do is we we kind of like try and recreate what your birthday party might have been back in 1982. So yeah. we have the top ten from your birthday. Well, this the biggest tune was Duran Duran. So and and it's an absolute cracking playlist. Planet Earth, yes. Um, was well, is there something I one. should know? Was was in e Let's Dance Boy at his peak for me. And Rio, her name is Rio, and she. Dances on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet dreams are made of this. Yes, rhythmics. all that. Um, Bonnie Tyler. Total, this is the top ten. Your birthday. Total eclipse of the heart. Total eclipse of the heart. Brilliant. Banana Rama. Orange juice. Oh, I love up. Banana Rama too. They were fantastic. Billy Jean was there yes, as well in the middle of that. That was a Leo Sayer and Spandau Ballet. And then the big albums was the UT War Records. So they were starting to make a bit of a name for themselves. And Tears for Fears. Tears for Fears were brilliant. What Would was they the all have been in the playlist at your birthday then? Well, more or less, yes. Uh, Duran Duran and uh, ABC, definitely. Yeah. You know, anything dancey, mm -hmm. you know. So really, really strong music. Um, and the biggest track of the year was Dexys, Come On Out. Midnight oh, Runners. Yeah. And um, you also had Culture Club in there as well. Um, Eddie Grant, um, Ebony and Ivory. When you think back, Ebony and Ivory, that's a weird track, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Paul McCartney and, and Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder, Wonder yeah. It would be ver verging on... Yeah, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't get past the... No, says, it wouldn't. Would it? No. Had the, a few lyric tweaks. Yes, uh, Barbara Streisand um, and Dar Straits, absolutely. But Roxy Music, I love. I went that? to Roxy Music in 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 um, the Hammersmith Odeon around that time. It was absolutely fantastic. Well, I went with people from Air Canada, <laughs> and it was great. <laughs> and people were all going dressed a la Roxy Music, uh -huh. you know. And at that stage, what you called the big model, um, Jerry Hall Jerry was Hall. married. She to was one Brand, of his one of his uh, their backing singers. And she and another girl were rocking at the back, you know, oh, weren't yeah, really yeah. putting anything in, but they're just rocking. And that uh, that was a brilliant night. Love, love it's funny, music. isn't it? All the music that you would have been into in 1982 was probably the biggest tracks and everybody was into it, but it makes you sound so cool talking about them, <laughs> you know, as if, do you know what I mean? Because yes. we talked about the music um, that we were into and whenever the, the kind of 
mid nineties, mid nineties may be all right, mm. but even if you go a little bit, it's all nonsense. It's rubbish, and you'd be ashamed of what it. What about Sade? Because she yeah. she had she been on the Hammersmith Odeon, yeah. come out in a big, um, you know, Mac and all singing these fabulous songs, and then. She was traveling out from Heathrow, and I checked her in. Ah, oh, class. <laughs> and that was amazing. It was amazing to meet her. You must have met <coughs> some people traveling, <coughs> seen sides of them that other people wouldn't see. <coughs> You're telling me it did. Pardon me. Some real characters. Misbehaving? Uh, putting it on. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, oh, there was, I'm not mentioning his name. Ah! No, I, 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 I don't mention his name. But he arrived for a flight with his wife. 40 minutes before it left. Now, as you probably appreciate in Terminal 3, from check-in to some of the gates was a good half hour, 35 minute walk, like down to gate 31 or whatever and all that. And he turned up and it, it, they were, people were informed to be there no later than an hour before departure. And his pre-reserved seats had been released because they are released an hour before. He rolled up 45 minutes before, 40 minutes before. And there was one hell of a row because See, the story quite famous, was it? The story's no use without yes. a name. I'm not, no, um, but it's like I'm not know, giving any names. And a general, or like, was it movies, music? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to categorize them. Uh, news, I'll just say. <laughs> oh. That's actually quite narrow. That'd be brilliant. I'll have to think about that. I had a very bad experience. You would have, wouldn't have have been very impressed with this. The last flight I was on coming back from London, um, it was in Heathrow. I was flying out of Heathrow and the flight was at 11 o'clock. And I'm normally really organized. Usually if my wife's with me, she's the PA, do, does everything. And I woke up, the, the, the phone that I'd set the alarm on had fell out of the charger during the night because it sat it on the bed. And then it died and I woke up, turned on the phone at half nine. I turned on the phone and I had to get from central London to Heathrow oh, for Christ. 11. Did and you take a taxi or get the Heathrow I got, Express? I, got a, got a, I had the ticket for, I had a return ticket for the Heathrow Express. Cool. Didn't get to use it because I ordered an Uber and said to the driver, got it like 10 to 10. And I was like, I have a flight at 11 to Heathrow. And he just went, Ugh. and he stepped on it and he got me there for... 25 past 10 well, and I went they in accept you? yeah oh, and, good. Like, you know how big it is when you yeah, go in the, the, the five. First, I had to, I, and I had a bag to check in mm -hmm. it was my guitar and I just said to them I'm at your mercy and the, and the first guy says no that's you're too late and this this woman came over and just pushed him out of the way and typed in she went run and mm. I, I, I was that that asshole. was good you got a supervisor kid yeah. sometimes you get a Debbie or a Tracy <laughs> and they I'm sorry you're far too late to be checked in for the service yeah that was the guy oh, the girl just cut across him oh, this yeah, cock good, said, good like, you're right my love she said what flight is it was 11 o'clock she said oh she said, you're gonna have to run and I was like yeah and she said gate 22 and I was that asshole you know when you're in the airport and you see somebody running at like 45 degree angle yes. with things hanging off them that was yes. me I had a guitar at a bag and then you get through security and you've still got miles to go all that. I, I bunked the security I, it was all that snake and stuff and I just went to the top and I just kept going sorry sorry mm -hmm. sorry luckily I didn't get like you know picked up for any metal detecting no. and I was straight through and I literally got walking down the wee gantry at a quarter to uh, quarter to eleven and I got uh, on and I couldn't to believe it. that I'd done Good it boy. yeah just about made it Come back to 1982, Julian's birthday. We're going to give you a gift. Sadly, not a real gift. You can choose between these are big items in the, in the early 80s. This is what everybody would have been getting for their birthday. You can either have a Commodore 64 computer, if that's of any interest to you. <laughs> right. No. Or you can have a Polaroid camera. Not actually, no. This is no, just, I, just no I understand that. <laughs> but if I was picking between those at that stage, I would have picked the Polaroid camera. Why? Because I enjoyed taking photographs of all aspects of places I went to and things that, and friends. Of course. I mean, I'm do, you're doing it all on your phone now. Mm -hmm. But at that stage, and the Polaroid camera were the one of the ones where you, it came out immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you held it up and then you peeled it back and there, you, there was the image. No, the camera I'd have gone for. In fact, I had one. That's darling. what I was going to say, did you have? I had one of them <laughs> years ago. Well, then the gift would be no use to me. I had to give you the camera. Well, you see, it, uh, as we're, we're talking. It. Sell well, it. You're I savvy. Yes. You sold, sold it to one of them. I'll sell it to shift. somebody at Heathrow or something, you know. <laughs> and do you still have those pictures? Like, do you, were you able to hang on to everything? There's or a big tin box in the underneath my desk with a whole lot of photographs in it that I mean to go through one of these days. But you don't. But I haven't done it yet. I find that that's something that like my wife will do is every now and again, if you walk in and you find her lifting old photographs out, 
just give her a wee minute because that's like a very she's hit <laughs> she's hit rock bottom. She's like going through like our our wet. We had a wedding album. You're like the old school, you know, sort oh, yes. of printed out like real. Oh, wedding album gathers dust under our bed. God help it, but. I find like photographs like that and we had Holly Hamilton chatting to her recently and she had pictures from 2004 was her year. So it's nice to go back like if you had a time capsule, would you have many pictures from 82 or was it after you got that camera or before? 82, know? and at that stage I, I, I was at Heathrow. I'm sure I have. I've got pictures of me in my uniform and all that. Mm. And, uh, and at that stage, you see, my friendship had begun with the Belfast Base BA shuttle crew. Because they were on a lot of the flights. Because I was doing sometimes three times a week, Belfast, London, Belfast, London. And so I got to, to be socialising with them. And uh, and then, in uh, just after 9-11, sorry to jump ahead. Mm, okay. um, that was when they closed the Belfast base. And all my friends went to long haul. So from that on, I used to go with them on their long haul flights. Five day Hong Kongs. Nine day Bangkok, Sydney, uh, night stop in New York, a wee trip to Phoenix. I did like five or six of those a year. Brilliant. Debt and danger, but I loved every minute <laughs> of it. And you would come back from a nine day Bangkok, Sydney, absolutely wrecked. <laughs> wrecked. I had to pick my words there. Time zones and all, but that, yes. that screw you up. Oh, the... it did screw you up. And then you'd come back in, and, and the next day you'd go into work. And what, one eye looking at the other looking for you, you know, you didn't know <laughs> where you were. Oh, that awful jet lag feeling is awful. I, I've only ever experienced it once and I, I felt like the room was vibrating whenever mm. I got jet lag. Like I genuinely thought when we got to Hawaii that there was an earthquake. Oh, and yeah. I was like lying on the ground and all like I, I, I took it quite It's badly. when you go into the likes of Los Angeles or Vancouver and you've left home at, to be, get the seven o'clock out of here in the morning. And you've arrived into Vancouver and it's something like, oh, say, half past one in the afternoon. And with your body, it is like <laughs> half nine. <laughs> and you're going out and doing things and you're like, it's a most peculiar feeling. Oh, I hate it. Would you say that if you had to choose one job or the other, your TV kind of career or the... Well, it's not the... funny. We were discussing this the other night and there's no two ways about it. There was a, a, a quirk of fate because when uh, Air Canada were closing the Belfast office and I was thinking about, well, I'm going to work in London, the manager of British Airways in Belfast phoned me and said, Julian, there's a job for you if you would want it in the cabin crew base working on the, on the shuttle, mm. if you would like it, but it's not going to be permanent. It's only for a year. And I thought, I can't leave a job that is permanent mm. uh, to, uh, and I could do this job and then be out of it again. So I, um, I stayed with Air Canada, but I went to the yearly, the year anniversary of British Airways and the bosses had come over from London and halfway through it, they got up and made an, an announcement and say, just so you all know, you're now all permanent. <laughs> so I would have been permanent and doing was <laughs> what I would have done. But of course, I was torn between two jobs that I adored. Mm -hmm. I love working in the airline, and I, I really was fascinated with the TV job. Yeah. Isn't it great they've had two that you loved? Because a lot I've of people very look through their lives and don't have one job. You, you meet people and they love. hate their job. Mm -hmm. And indeed, at Air Canada, uh, halfway through my career, uh, a lot of people were made uh, unemployed from other departments, so they came to passenger service. And they hated it. And they hated talking to the public and dealing with the public. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to be there. And I thought, well, what are you doing here if you don't want to be here? Yeah. But, of course, in London, they needed the do re me. I'm lucky like that as well. I did three, had three jobs in my life, training people in the call centre, loved that, mm. and then moved into doing the wedding band. I played in the wedding band for 12 years. Didn't feel like work at all, really enjoyed it, and then moving into doing stand-up and all this stuff. And I think when, you've, when you're in a job that you love... You you don't need to take the first opportunity to come, so you let a lot of the ones pass you by. But when something good comes up, you end up moving into another job that you end up loving yes. because you were comfortable That's in right. the other one. Yes. So you know you did, you didn't go for the first thing, and you, you can't, it's kind and of like you a, benefit a from any effect. experience you've had along the way. Yeah, and that's what life's all about. Yeah, it, you're both your careers kind of 
fed into each other almost. But what used to facing. get me in London is they used to sometimes think of the way I said things or talked about things. And yet I would hear somebody on check-in saying to a passenger, is you telling me what you has not got no more hamburgers, <laughs> what you is not showing to me? And I thought, what? And they have a cheek to say they don't understand yes, Belfast. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and, uh, this passenger may be of, of Indian nationality. Yeah, so you have how to can they understand what down, she's yeah. saying? Yeah. Has I, you not got no more arm baggage, which you is not showing to me? <laughs> it's not English. I, I had that um, over in London. I did a gig, one of my first ever gigs in London uh, last September. And after I was chatting to a few people, some of them knew me a lot, most of them didn't. And this guy said, he says, you're, you're very good. He says, but you got to slow down what you're saying. And just enunciate a little better. And I was like, he literally said, whoa, whoa. I was like, that's not, I say water. Like that's closer yes. to the, the, you know, but whoa. And whoa, I just uh. always find it's funny that they kind of expect you to kind of meet them at, and like almost like do their accent. It's like, no, there's people that are speaking better and clearer, you know. But yeah, like so. And then you come somebody uh, come across somebody in North America saying to you, "Would you like any more water? <laughs> water, this the soft yeah. thing, water, water." We were we were in uh, L.A. or sorry, in Vegas for um, it was it was somebody's fortieth, and they a friend of mine asked the server for Mountain Mountain Dew, mm -hmm. and the guy kind of stopped and looked at him, and he was like, I'm "Sorry, sir," and he says, "Mountain Dew," and he was like. And I says, Mountain Dew? And he, oh, Mountain uh, Dew. Yeah, well, yes. I was like, I was, what, do we serve Mountain Dew? Like, he thought it was some kind of cocktail. Yes. Like, sorry, anti Semitic cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> movies in 1982 took over. What I mean, I'm really impressed by the music. And the movies is just 10 of the best films ever. If you look at the top 10, Chariots of Fire. Yes. Absolute Belter. Um, is that the Ronan one? I was, that's a wee bit before my time. Chariots well, of Fire. It's, was, it's, it, was it about Ronan? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and the Star Wars series was continuing. See, but this is the thing: Star Wars would have been um, nineteen seventy-eight, but Star Wars: This Is a New Hope, Episode Four, which is the first Star Wars movie, was still in the top ten by eighty-two. So, do you remember going to see it for the first time? Yes, I did. The, the first Star Wars movie I got to see in Comber, and I went with friends, and we queued literally round the block outside the cinema, and we'd been and got fish and chips, and we're at the, in our hands as we were queuing. Were you allowed to bring your own fish and chips? Well, well, well you, you couldn't take it in with you. Oh, but right. in the queue, you could. Oh, well, yeah, you okay, know, yeah. You're doing it anyway. And because we were starving. And uh, I was thinking, we're not going to get in here, but we did. And I remember the first opening credits and the battle cruise that goes over your head. Mm. You know, yeah, I was just... Oh, fabulous. Loved you. You were a big Star Wars. Did Absolutely. you maintain that Star Wars fandom? Yes, or was I like... did. Yes, I mean sometimes it gets a wee bit over the top. I think, but I still enjoy it. And I'm a great fan of Star Trek too. Mm. Star Captain... Trek. It was a big film in in um, eighty two as well. The Wrath of uh, Khan Khan. in Star Trek two. That would have been it was a big movie in the summer of that year. Vintage stuff. Poltergeist. That's a scary yeah, film. Absolutely, it was. That is a scary movie. To this day, and that's certain gentlemen. Rocky Three, which is the B.A. Baracus one, is that right? Oh, right. No, Rocky... Yeah, Rocky didn't really ring my bell no. at all. Rocky Three, I think, is was, was um, Mr. T. And then number one movie of the year, can either of you guess? Absolute Stone Cold classic. Still one that people would revisit all the Close time. Close Encounters? No. no. Indiana Jones? No. But it's your closest, Julian, if we, if we play the oh, game. Oh, I know. Not Last Tango in Paris. Last Tango in Paris was a big movie uh, that year, but no, E.T. Oh. E.T. E.T. I yeah. bawled my eyes out at the end of that. It bored you. Oh, it bawled eyes. right out, yeah. <laughs> of E.T.? Uh, what happens well, at the absolutely. end? I, was, I saw He it. leaves him and goes yes. back there. Yeah, he, when, at the, le when he was leaving to go back. And where where whole, is he from, E.T.? If from some plan, I, they never actually said which one. I was going to name an obscure town from but was, here. <laughs> but E.T. go home and all that. And, and there was a bicycle race at the end. E.T. had been dead. That's and right, and yeah. it, they got him in a, he was coming around. They got him out in the basket of a bike. And were racing through the town, all the kids. And they came to a blockade. And as they got to the blockade, they just all lifted and went up. And went, I I bawled yeah. my eyes out. Brilliant. And then when he left in the rocket and said goodbye to the him and the dog, yeah, oh, be I, good and I howled went. into my <laughs> fist. Do you know that joke? What's E.T. short for? 
Oh, he's got wee legs. The other joke was, you used to be able to say, and it would, it would depend on who you were trying to criticise. So say you're making a joke at the expense of Catholics, or say you're making a joke, you say, how do you know E.T. E. was a Catholic? How do you know E.T. was a Protestant? <laughs> and the person is because he looked like one. <laughs> oh, Jesus but it would be, you know, it would yeah. be... Interchangeable, replaced. yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. wouldn't have said that on the UTV. <laughs> <laughs> Introducing it. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been in your, your mind, though. <laughs> that would have been brilliant, your last <laughs> night. It would have been your last night. <laughs> whether it was planned or not the um do you remember the the knockoff mac and me did you ever see that mac yeah. and me was it was a, a, a piss take not a piss it was somebody trying to cash in on the et thing and they made this really bad oh. um but like my Big my cheeks yeah uh, but my kicks. sister lo- my i have a, my sister special needs and she'd like latches on to certain films and she normally has good taste but she prefers <laughs> mac and me yeah. over the actual et and it is such a terrible film anybody listening has to check it out it is so bad that, that, that it's good I think if we're wrapping up, I would like to to, to make an observation between from having watched you two oh. chatting. First of all, 1982 was a vintage year, so I'm delighted we talked about that year. And second of all, whenever we were talking about the, you know, Julie not wanting a Commodore 64, but wanting a Polaroid, I think that just sums you up. You're not a guy who had any interest in, in, in having something that you would be doing either on your own or at home. Do you, did you ever have a nice house? Because it strikes me as you would never have been arsed because you're constantly on the road and you're constantly out. Um, Anytime you talk about, oh, I was having some date, <coughs> it's always, you're in a restaurant. It's never as in the house doing something. It's always out. Well, apart from... Do you even have a house? Oh, I do. <laughs> I, I, I have an apartment in Belmont. Okay. And Are you uh, ever in it? I suppose to be the next question. Well, I, I intend to be in this weekend, actually, because <laughs> I've never stopped all week. I've been out every day and every night. And this weekend, I'm not putting my nose out over the door. So uh, I, I'll be in then. But I, I, I guess I am out quite a lot. Uh, basically for eating, I suppose, because I can't cook. And all my stuff, my food, basically in the fridge is from Marks and Spencer. You know when you go along the rack yeah. and all the food is all there? And sometimes I go along that. And no disrespect to Marks and Spencer's, but I could just vomit over the whole lot of it because <laughs> I, I know it all inside out. <laughs> and I, I, I try to eat a lot of salads and all that. But uh, no, a lot of the time I am out with friends because that's when you get to socialize and everything. I remember in the days of, do you remember Bebo, the, the social yes. media thing? Yes. So early, very early 2000s. And I was friends with a girl who I worked with and she'd gone on to be like her crew or whatever, a cabin crew. And there was, she put pictures up. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the pictures, you came into the apartment and you, you just, and like, just these snapshots of you going over straight over, opened the big bottle of wine, poured yourself in, and you were given, say, yeah. he's given off stink about uh, someone. And just like, I wanted to be at that party. I was so jealous. You just came in and just took over. God, I wonder what that was. And it was just like, like, it seemed to me that you've got loads of, everybody that I talk to, you know, you're just loads of friends and you're always sort of on top form and out and about. And I've got loads and loads of acquaintances. There's no two ways about it because mm-hmm. of the various industries I've been in and the like. Uh, but close friends, you know, I think really close friends, five, five mm-hmm. really, maybe maybe six or seven, but I know a hell of a lot of people. And sometimes, you know, I'm walking down the street and say, oh, what about you, Julian? And I'm going, hi, how are you? And I'm thinking, who is this? <laughs> is this somebody from the airline industry with their clothes on? <laughs> you know, not not in their uniform sort of thing. Oh, I thought you meant like they were, they were uh, very uh, debauched uh, people. Uh, you knew them more oh, with no, their clothes no, off. No, 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 <laughs> no. Definitely not. I didn't recognize you with your clothes <laughs> yeah, on there. Exactly. Yeah. But you're doing that thing of trying to scan. Do I know this person personally? I have or conversations and the whole me? way through the first two minutes of it, I'm fishing, you know, to What find do you a, call them in the meantime? What is your go-to? Darling. Darling. Okay. <laughs> so Men and women are all darling. I can know, darling. you know, sort of thing. Oh, okay, yes. When was the last time I saw you now? <laughs> and again, you're fishing. Like, what? Where are they from? What a... Oh, and sometimes then it turns out, oh, you gave my daughter a cup in Keedy in 1998. And I'm thinking, oh, right, of course. <laughs> oh, gee, darling. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, all that. We'll have to wind it back and see how many times did you call me darling in the first five minutes. Yeah. We're working out, hey, <laughs> did I? I? <laughs> no, no I don't. <laughs> What's your go-to whenever you don't know somebody's name, Paddy? Oh, Jesus, I don't know now. I... Mine is definitely, oh, it's yourself. 
I, I, I just kind of nice call it for what it is. And I find I'm doing that more now with people who I'll talk to them for a second and, I go, and then I'll just go, I'm sorry, do I, do I know you? And then if you do, I find it's better because if you, you do know them personally, on, then you yes. can go, right, okay. And it gives you that. But then if you don't, and they're like, no, no, it's just, I just, I like your stuff. And you go, okay, right, dead on. So I'd rather, I would just die of embarrassment if I went with darling or whatever and they just realize he doesn't know who i am so i'm just call uh, for what it is an example of that was i'm, I'm not shooting a big line again it's oh. on staff travel right uh, subject to space <laughs> i'm in hong kong going up <laughs> still take this I, i'm going up the escalator in causeway bay tube station and with a crowd of ba people and coming down is our clatter of teenagers and as they get opposite they go as they're passing, oh, Julian, you Julian. And I'm thinking, what? In Hong Kong, you Ju-? I said, oh, stay there, I'll come down. So I come back down. I said, uh, how do you know me? He says, we're at Methody and Campbell. And they were home for the holidays in Hong Kong where they live. Why were they speaking with an accent? In that well, they were Chinese. <laughs> oh, right, okay. I'm trying to give that. you I mean, authentication Kong, here. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> What do you want them to do? The fucking eyes or yes. something? Oh, no, gosh, I just, no. no I just, Wouldn't I just, be doing that on the UTV. <laughs> it, just, it just took us by surprise. So that, like, you're thousands of miles and, from home yes. and these kids knew who you were and that's where they were it, 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 it was priceless, like, you know. But I, it's funny, I've been in Sydney and everything and people have said, hello, Julian. I was in a supermarket in, in Sydney down at... Uh, down, near the harbour and this girl in a sweet shop came out and says you're Julian I said I, I, uh, she says oh I just arrived here three weeks ago to take up uh, a semi-permanent position and I said well how are you feeling are you homesick she says oh dreadful I says that'll pass mm. I says meet a nice man and go for it you'll be grand <laughs> subject this piece <laughs> <laughs> That could be your uh, the name of your memoir. Subject, Subject to, to space. space. Subject to space. <laughs> no. But that suggests that you're living your life and just waiting for an opportunity to, to, to come up rather than being the guy that gets all the opportunities. Uh, well, uh, well, this is true. That's right. You know, Subject to space is right. But that's the way. Uh, of course, when you're traveling with, with crew on the flight, you're not subject to space. You're going to be on it with them. Mm. But you check in as a subject to space passenger mm. and you go to the gate and then you get on the aircraft and you're in 1K. <laughs> no. I remember my dad telling me a story about when he was going to fly to Amsterdam in the late seventies, and they'd oversold the flight or something. Oh, and they yeah. turned up and said, "I'm sorry, we don't have any seats for you." And they said, "But if you're okay with it, you can sit with the crew." And they were like, "Fuck, nah, nah." They didn't want to do it. My dad was like, "Oh, well, well, well what do you mean sit with the crew?" He says, "Well, there's two seats." And one of you will be with the air hostesses and the other one will sit you somewhere else. So his mate straight across, I'll sit with the air hostesses. He wanted oh, to be in amongst yes. them. So he got on, he went down the back and says, where am I sitting? And they sat my dad at the back of the cockpit and says, that's the only space we've got for you. So he kind of like sat and got to watch everything. Heard them wow. like sort of asking for coming into different air space, you know, asking for permission and all that. He said it was the best flight of his life. When he got to the end, he got off buzzing, couldn't believe that, you know, he'd got all this experience. S- saw his mate thinking he'd have the same. He was fucking raging. He says, what's wrong with you? He says, I was like a piece of shit back there. Could oh. you move? Could you give me that? Would you, you're in our way. He says, I was just pushing. He says, oh, I pra- practically got to fly the plane. He was I mean, I've done a Singapore once, both ways in a jump seat. But when you know the crew, it's What's all jump right. Seat? Jump seat is by the door, and it, and it, normally the crew sit on it for takeoff. Oh, oh yeah. And uh, <laughs> but I sat in it the whole way. Uh, and then I went to the bunks at one stage and lay for an hour and had a sleep after they'd had their sleep. On that was except. But I mean, when you're with the crew doing that, okay, it's an awful seat to be in. But you're going to Singapore and you're with the crew and you're having a good laugh. Mm. You know, flies in. Part Abs- the pond, like. Absolutely, <laughs> flies in as right. Well, thanks for joining us, Julian. I've really enjoyed chatting. Well, Hopefully, well, it's been nice talking to you. Thank you for having me. Nice to be with you too. The Wonder Year with Patty Raff.